Hey everyone, I'm just trying to get my video started up. So while we are working on the video, I'm just going to help go ahead and get us started. Um, today, I'm going to be taking through you through a personal narrative training. Uh, so I subtitled today's training activism through storytelling, because using your story is one of the um, most simple but most effective ways of activism, regardless of who you are. Um, your story can be made powerful. So I want to give a special thank you to um, one of HSDA's former chairs, Jeremy Ornstein, who did a personal narrative training at my first summit, which was two, two years, yes, two years ago. Um, and I did a, another personal narrative training with him last week. It uh, happened Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday where I met Rebecca and Violet, who you will hopefully be hearing from today. Um, but Jeremy shared the same story that he shared uh, at Summit two years ago in our training last week. And um, honestly, I have gotten chills twice in my life. And one of them was at the benediction of George Floyd's funeral. And the second time was during Jeremy's um, story, during his personal narrative. So um, he's gotten much stronger at it and it's really impressive. And it made me think that it was worthwhile to give you guys this training once again. So um, I hope that my Zoom isn't like covering anything, but my name's Love Lundy. I, I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, that's my social media handle for Instagram and Twitter. I'll be studying political science with a minor in music at Spelman. Uh, I'm an upcoming freshman, so very excited. Uh, I have been involved in activist work kind of up and down the East Coast for the past three years, um, mainly in Alabama, working on Doug Jones's campaign and some local campaigns, including Amy Wazaluka and Peter Jofreon, who was going against Mo Brooks for AL5. Um, but I've also done some work, work, work with March for Our Lives, which is um, kind of how I met Ariana Smart, who got me into HSDA, uh, our vice chairwoman. I can't, I feel like I'm saying the years wrong. Last, last year, <laughs> two years ago, Anyways, um, but yes, I'm also a musician. Um, that link brings you to the lyrics and to how you can listen to my EP. So, um, personal narrative is really just about evaluating your identity and evaluating your values. Um, we're gonna talk about several ways that you can kind of brainstorm and build up your personal narrative um, and the connecting factor in all of those brainstorm methods is a value thread. Um, so that word value, I really want to highlight, but I also thought that it was important to highlight the word identity because in, you know, my speaking at protests um, in the past couple of weeks, I've talked about how dangerous, how dangerous it is to not accept your identity, um, particularly as a non-Black person, um, because it makes way for 
privilege to, ah, oh, we've got my video. Hi guys. So it makes way for, for privilege to run rampant in your life. And not to say that privilege won't exist when you acknowledge your identity, but acknowledging your identity certainly helps you move forward. Um, so with that being said, understand that your story is what makes up personal narrative. Um, you are the only person capable of telling your personal narrative because you're only going to be inf using information and experiences from yourself. Um, and I just say that to point out the fact that you shouldn't say something like, oh, I, last week I was at the grocery store and some woman had seven kids and she couldn't pay for her groceries and it made me sad. Um, like that's, that's not where you're going to pull really. I mean, you can say that you saw an experience, but you should really talk more about how it, it affected you and what you did moving forward. Um, and I have here a pro tip journal. I journal kind of religiously. Um, and I just think that journaling is a great opportunity for you to get to know yourself better. Um, and once you have a better understanding of yourself, I guess it becomes easier to pick out moments in your life when you need to come up with a personal narrative on the fly, if you will. Um, but even just if you, if you think that you're about to come into a space where you will need to tell your personal narrative, um, it's, I find it really important to write something before because you never know what your brain might ask your hand to write. <laughs> um, and it may be, you know, something profound that you didn't think you were capable of thinking of or speaking. So personal narrative the whole a whole personal narrative is called a linked narrative but it's break broken down into a story of self um a story of us and a story of now so and please tell me if my zoom is blocking i really hope not okay so as i was saying earlier there's that idea that personal narrative and all the different types of thinking about personal narrative is linked by a value. So we like to call that like a value thread. Um, and as I mentioned, the final product is called a linked narrative. That's when you kind of go through your story of self, us now. And in the training that we did last week, uh, it was kind of thought that self, story of self, us and now can stay around two minutes and that the linked narrative can stay around five minutes. So when you guys kind of um, flesh out personal narrative and try it out in your mentor groups or whenever you guys have the opportunity to just keep those time frames in mind, um, two minutes for the self us now and five minutes for the linked narrative and the timing will kind of make more sense when I talk more about how to come up with each of these. Um, but this here on the left, challenge, choice and outcome um you go through that process when you're when you were thinking about a story of self us or now so starting with self um the point of a story of self and i'm going to call this kind of the triple u um understanding of this but so the point of the story of self is to connect with another person. Um, and so if you're thinking of it like I'm speaking at a protest and I want these people to do something, how am I going to connect with them? You use a story of self. So you identify a moment. Oh, I love that typo right there. Excuse that. A moment in your life that brought you to a better understanding of a value. So. I want you guys, if you would, to just drop some values that we think about when we're thinking about social justice. Um, and I invite panelists to do the same. Um, what, what is a value, 
even if it's not your your most favorite or your most important value, what's a value that comes to mind when you're thinking about social justice? Yes, love. Thank you, Brooke. Empathy, inclusion. Love you, Sarah. Respect, humbleness. You guys have lots and lots and lots of options to choose from. And some of these words are super simple, like change, hope, like respect, open-mindedness. When you think of that, even if you just think of a value, the first story that comes to your mind when you think of that value, think about a choice that you made once you identified or once you experienced that challenge. And then think about, ooh, no, 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 no. I hate this for me. How do I go back? Okay, it's fine. Everything's fine. Um, yeah, so how does that choice affect how you exist now? And if you're having trouble thinking about how the choice affects how you exist now, um, go back to the challenge because that will identify that and some emotions for you. And a really important part of every story, whether it's a story of self now or us or a linked narrative is the ask. Um, so when you're speaking to a group, once you have spoken on your challenge and your choice on and your outcome, say, you know, use this information and evaluate whether or not the ask that I'm going to bring to you right now is is important based on what like the information that you just gave that person um does that make sense am i making sense am i speaking too fast is everything great can i get some validation in the chat thank you <laughs> amazing so on to um story of us so the idea with story of us is unity and this can be applied in several different ways especially if you're thinking about personal narrative in a not rally or protest context right like let's say you are in a work meeting or you're on a board or something and you want somebody or several people in that room to understand um and kind of to like re reground themselves i think that using the story of us is a really great tool to reground a group um so you can use these and i'm going to share this this slideshow with you guys once this is done but also feel free to screenshot um in for your challenge think about wow that typo is in every slide let's get a round of applause for that <laughs> Um, think about when the group moved you. Think about when something that the group did moved you. And that can be that, that it moved you in a positive way and you were proud of the group and it inspired you to move forward or you thought that the group didn't act as it should have. And then go on to your choice and your outcome. And I would say that with the ask for the story of us, it normally has to do with joining the group or as I said, regrounding the purpose of the group. And using the story of us is a really great way to um, open conversations about the purpose of a group. And I think that identifying um, a purpose is a really important aspect of, uh, I don't know where that accent came from, but aspects of aspect of being able to organize effectively is like understanding your shared purpose. And you can reach that through the story of us. Um, so the story of now talks about urgency and and it establishes urgency your story of now should always establish urgency um that challenge when you're thinking about the challenge normally you're thinking more recent i would say for story of self you're thinking about like something that formed you um story of now kind of re-establishes your belief in the value that you might have thought about in story of self um, and make sure that your ask in the story of now is clear and concise and 
um, something that I, I'm sure that Violet will do, uh, who I will be inviting to share her linked narrative um, after I'm done explaining this, but she'll ask you to throw your hands up or clap or smile or dance um, to say that you are with her or whoever is presenting. So um, Violet, if you are ready to share your linked narrative, uh, I would love to introduce you. I met Violet during our, um, oh, Rebecca has a video for us, amazing. I met Violet during our training and she is just a light beam of joy. And I was, I'm so excited to bring her to you guys. I'm just gonna stop talking and let her speak. Can you hear me? Cool. Thank you, love, so much for asking me to do this. Yeah, met love last week. Feel so blessed to have met her, and yeah, really grateful to be here. I am very much learning, like the process of building um, a public narrative and a link narrative as well. So um, please bear with me, but hopefully this is helpful. Um, so I want to tell a story of when I was a junior in high school. Um, and I was sitting in my high school's auditorium at play rehearsal. And it was February 15th, 2018. I'd heard about a school shooting happening, but it wasn't until I went to my phone to read the news that I read about Parkland. And I was reading through the details of everything that had happened. And I got to this one story of this girl who was a junior like me, and she had had to hide in this closet within her classroom and she didn't have access to her phone. So her family didn't know where she was for four hours. And underneath was a picture of her mother and her embracing and her crying. And in that moment, I was absolutely shocked to my core and so moved because I saw myself, I saw my school, I saw my community in the story of what had happened to that girl and what had happened in Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland. And I was lurched into action because I realized that this was happening everywhere. This was a national epidemic. Any one of us could be the next one to be the victim of this epidemic and we had to do something. So I reached out to my friend in front of me, grabbed her shoulder, we went out into the hallway, she held me and I wept and I said to her, we have to do something. She shook her head, yes. So I texted everyone in my school's great group chats and said, hey, tomorrow we're having a walkout to demand gun reform. And the next day at 8.15 in the morning, 15 of us walked out. There are only 15 of us, but we had signs and we cheered and we clapped and we yelled and we screamed and cars went by and honked their horns. And I felt in that moment with the 15 of us that we were all united in this moment of collective outrage to move to collective action. And those 15 people were actually able to mobilize the entire town because we realized in this moment that all of us were at risk. We all had a stake in this. So then later on, we had a walkout of 150 people. And after that, we made international news because the first walkout in our town. And then we were able to have a countywide march. And after that, we were able to write two gun reform bills and organize and lobby with our community coming together and pass them at the state level. And I realized that there was a sort of domino effect where I read one person's direct story and that I was moved to action and texted all those people and then 15 people walked out and then it exploded and came together as this community shared in this outrage and shared in this knowledge that we had to do something to make things change. And last week at the public narrative training where I met love, uh, I felt this again because again, we were in this moment of shared collective outrage. We had seen George Floyd and we had seen this collective story of racism in our country and it had lurched us all into action into this moment and our challenge with that training was figuring out how do we communicate that how do we effectively tell our stories about what brought us to this moment such that we can inspire and mobilize masses and we're all pretty nervous public narrative is pretty daunting so it's definitely tricky to start sharing but I remember the story that love shared about being in her school and seeing in the playground and seeing folks uh, other students with the wind blowing through their hair and realizing that my the wind doesn't blow through my hair like that and and having that ground her and like coming to this moment with that being at the root and and that being the reason for 
wanting to make this change happen. And as we were listening to the love story, we all leaned in, all of us on this call, and we were absolutely raptured. We were completely focused in what she was saying and drawn together by this line, by this thread, seeing and hearing our stakes echoing through in her words and coming together as this united family, coming together collectively in action to share our stories the way that I'm doing right now with as many people as possible. And I know that everyone on this call is feeling this moment of reckoning as well. And you're all here because we wanna do something about it. We know we have to do something about it. And as I'm speaking, as we're together right now, black voices and stories are still being cut down, being tear gassed and pepper sprayed and incarcerated and shot. And that is what we're up against. And in this moment, tons of stories are flooding, pouring out peeling back the layers of the fact the American dream is a complete lie and peeling back such that we see that systematic racism is as integral to our nation as the Second Amendment. But the thing about these stories is there are these moments moving people, motivating these masses to action. They're the fuel that is feeding this fire, these flames of revolutionary change. And that's why I want every single person on this call to craft your own personal narrative of why you're fighting to defend Black lives and why you're a part of this movement. And then I want you to share it all over your circles, social media, news, wherever you can get it, because someone else is going to see that. They'll see you, they'll know you, and they'll see themselves. They'll see themselves, they'll understand that they have a stake too and that we need them to join them as well. And that is what is going to get the masses on our side. That's what's going to actually power the revolutionary systematic change that I know we need. So if you are going to make a, your own personal narrative about why you are fighting to dismantle the white heteropatriarchy and white supremacy in this country, I want you to pop an exclamation part, exclamation point in the chat right now. Pop them in there. I want to see your stories all over social media. I want to see it all over the news. I want everyone in your family, in your friend groups, in your community in town to see you and your stories so that we can join together this collective outrage to collective action together. That's a lot of exclamation points. Amazing. Oh, so. Thank you, guys. Violet absolute love of my life thank you very very kindly very kindly i think that um oh i kind of i should have been on this slide that's funny well um i think that your story i think may have helped people just get a bit of a better understanding <laughs> of how to put this together so i really appreciate you uh for hopping on and violet is just finishing up her gap year um which she spent doing electoral work with sunrise movement so thank you so much violet for taking the time out of your busy schedule and your rest to um come talk to us we really appreciate it and to close us off i am going to share um a personal narrative that i shared on thursday um a bit reformed and then we'll uh move into our triple a organizing uh training which i'm also involved in so cheers to this um my name is love lundy i am an 18 year old activist and musician from edgewater new jersey while i was born in hoboken and raised mainly in edgewater i've also spent a significant period of time down south and i actually just graduated from bob jones high school in madison alabama in the fall i'll be studying poli sci and music at swelling college in atlanta georgia 2020 has been an interestingly peaceful break in the past couple of years in my life but it uh, has still been action-packed i've been a sort of on a secret and self-proclaimed hiatus from politics and activism once I was diagnosed with diabetes in 2018, and especially six months later when three Black candidates lost in the 2019 to 2020 HSDA e-board election. But when the post-election appointed diversity director Brooke Solomon contacted me to inform me that she'd been terminated along with her position, I was horrified and I was hurt. I later came to understand that my friend and previous unofficial running uh, mate for vice chair was terminated from her position as well, without warning for inactivity. I couldn't even comprehend my feelings, especially my anger. Um, when I had conversations with member of the e members of the e-board who gave Brooke ridiculous excuses and absolutely dismissed my voice and existence in a call. 
When the HSDA body was informed of the chair and vice chair's casual sexism and racial insensitivity, they demanded the resignation of the entire e-board, put the organization in receivership of the AAB under the leadership of the liaison board headed by Brooke Claire and I, and we had six weeks to fix the organization, rewrite the bylaws, plan a virtual HSDA summit, and run elections with the help of the AAB. Now I'm here at Summit, watching you guys learn and soak all this information in, equally extremely energized and exhausted. I have been protesting in Alabama and New Jersey, and will soon likely be doing it in the city too. As I mentioned, I'm diabetic and I have stomach issues and I have been working for the past month and a half. But in the past couple of months, while I have been learning about everything that's been happening in HSDA and the fact that black women are just continuing to be ignored in literally every organization that I have been involved in, I, I found this piece of scripture that essentially described Jesus as an activist. And I felt more empowered than I had ever felt in my life because I came to the understanding that, you know, as a Christian, I should be trying to become more like Jesus. But in that vein, I'm trying to become more an activist. Um, and then during this personal narrative training, I realized that activism and, and learn, teaching other people how to be activists is so easy because you can just teach people how to better tell their stories. Um, because as Violet mentions, Violet mentioned, stories break down barriers. So um, I really want to invite you guys to take the information that we're giving you during this summit. Consider the history of the organization, specifically what's been going on in the past four months. And go forward understanding that if you are complacent, um, I personally am ashamed <laughs> because this organization has shown us what the harms of complacency and um, this organization will also show us what happens when you just address it, um, which you can do once you have a better understanding of your identity. So um, I hope that today's training was helpful. I hope that, um, Everybody had a great time. Oh, somebody else is diabetic. I love you. Thank you all. And I will see you guys at the AAA training. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Violet. Oh, I love you guys. That story was kind of booty, but we're gonna pretend like it wasn't. Thank you, Rebecca, for being in here. I'm so sorry that we didn't get to share your story. Okay, I should probably go since I'm leading that other training. <laughs> Bye, y'all.